This meeting is being recorded. Great, all right. Uh, welcome everyone. Um, today's my first day in the chair, so please uh, forgive me if I um, forget all kinds of stuff. But I will, do my best. Um, I will start with the uh, call to order and roll call. Um, if I can go through and just get everybody to say, that they're here. Um, Gurkharn? Here. Uh, David? Here. Paul? Here. Uh, Ezra? Here. Donna? Donna? Can you? Here. Hear? Oh, great. Thank you. Um, and I don't, uh, and so I think we're um, missing uh, Commissioner Axe of the, of the regular folks. Do I, I don't have to go through the, uh, the reps from, um, from the commission, do I? Nope, just the commissioners. Okay, thank you. All right, um, so the next one is approval of the agenda. Can I get uh, somebody to make a motion, please? Motion to approve the agenda. Like a second. Can I get a second? Oh, that was Gokarn or Commissioner okay, Suthi? Neville. Sorry. Commissioner second. Neville. Neville. Second. Are you guys having trouble hearing me? Uh, we're good now. Okay, because yeah. I'm yelling at the top of my lungs, but as long as you can hear me. <laughs> yeah. It's a little soft, but yeah, as, as you're yelling, it, it, it helps. <laughs> yeah, let us know if you need to take a break from the yelling. <laughs> All right, uh, so let's call the roll. So this is um, in favor. This is a, on the motion to approve uh, the agenda. Uh, Commissioner Sufi? Aye. Commissioner Sandino? Aye. Commissioner Jacobs? Aye. Commissioner Neville? Aye. Commissioner Beeman? Aye. <laughs> motion carries. Uh, so we have uh, brief announcements. I think um, I will go last. So can we start with staff? Do you have any brief announcements? So to ask for uh, public comment on the agenda. Ah, thank you. Failed at the first post. Uh, is there anybody? Uh, is there any um, anyone here for public comment on the agenda? I'm not seeing anything. So good. I am so diligently reading my uh, my my minutes my agenda here. I think my, I might just add in Paul to public comment because um, it's actually set as as uh, as item four. Oh yeah, that's for general public comment, but there is a public comment called after the approval of the agenda as well. Okay, thank you. All right, um, right. So back to brief announcements. Any for staff? Um, no announcements tonight. On the staff side, I don't know if Kelly has anything to add, but I don't have any further announcements. Did, did I know that Elena was not going to be here? I, I don't know if she knew. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that was communicated to you, but no, she's not. She's not going to be here this evening. I didn't, I didn't know. Okay, great. Oh, Donna. Um, could we just ask for an update on whether the certified financial statement has been completed? Has not been completed yet. Um, we are still in the progress uh, of working on that. And the expect expectation of that to be completed is going to be the late fall. Okay. Well, since we're in the question asking mood, um, is there uh, is there a plan to update the long range forecast model? Or make it publicly available because apparently it's updated it's just not publicly available yes 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 we do so um we will be able to make that uh, available as soon as tomorrow wow <laughs> watch me fall out of my chair well done all right that's, that's oh, only, only because you asked <laughs> me and lots of other people but no thank you that i'm really pleased it's a great way to start okay thank you um i think i'm going to uh keep going while i'm feeling lucky uh, Commissioner, I think 
uh, Dan, Dan's here tonight, but um, he's the only one. Anything, Dan? Uh, sorry, Commissioner Carson. Uh, actually, Councilman Carson. Um, but uh, no, I, I don't have anything uh, that isn't on your agenda. Great. Thank you, Council Member Carson. Um, okay. Uh, liaisons. Any? Did we have any meetings since since the last um, commission meeting? Downtown plan. I, trees. I do not have an update for uh, climate action. No. All right. That was so short. I don't have to recuse myself. Oh, there's Donna. Yes, sorry, Ezra, I thought we were doing that at the end of the meeting. Um, but um, so Michael and I are on the downtown plan subcommittee and we don't have anything to report, but I don't want you to think that we haven't been in discussions or reviewing the EIR. It's just that the, the nature of this EIR is a little bit abstract because we're moving to a form-based code. So it doesn't yeah. have the same degree of tangible project that you could really analyze from a fiscal perspective at this point. So right now we don't actually have any comments to offer that are fiscally related. Well, thank you for that. And I also like, I got to get better at this. Um, for the liaisons, we probably should take it off the uh, agenda and just have it done once at the very end. With the, with the Because as you say, the liaison stuff is all around the, um, the subcommittees. Okay, so Vaughn, if you can just make a note of that. Happy to, yeah, we'll make a note, we'll edit the slides in the future in the agenda. Great. Oh, David, please. My, my suggestion is we're just to leave it the way it is. Uh, the liaison comments could be beyond the subcommittee reports. I think that's the purpose of somebody on their own did something or have something to report beyond uh, what they're doing on the subcommittee. So that'd be my suggestion. It could work either way, but I'd just leave it on there. Okay. Well, let me, let me think on it. Um, I, I sort of like them having all grouped at the end there, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll take that on board if you feel feel strongly about it. So are we going to continue to do it the update now or at the end? I'm sorry. I was, I was reading about what I had just missed. Let, let's keep going. Let's keep going now. I, I opened the genie of the bottle. Are you going to say anything, Gurkhan? Oh, sorry. For oh, yeah. So that basically, um, apparently there was a meeting on Monday, August 29th for at the Natural Resources Commission for the, um, for the CAAP. So what I'll go ahead and do is I can either pull the video or the uh, meeting minutes to get updated for the next meeting. Thank or you. Commissioner Axe was there. So. Oh, yes, uh, I'm here. I I, I, I couldn't join the meeting. The link on the website, on the City of Davis website, doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 don't, I couldn't find the email sent by Elena. Did, did she send an email? I guess so. So I tried to join through the uh, City of Davis uh, link, and uh, it says the meeting expired. I couldn't uh, attend just to um maybe let the staff know that it is not possible to attend the meeting uh through the link on city of davis website mm -hmm. we're checking it out right now okay thank so, you didn't, we weren't aware of that so yeah thanks. it's not urgent uh, yeah i don't know it's like if you are just a citizen who want to attend the meeting through um the city link it doesn't work well, that, but it, the, it actually is urgent. We have to fix it if that's if that's the case. So um, the yeah. clerk is checking right now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Please let us know if there's an issue because I think it impacts on what we can do. All right, and welcome, Commissioner. Thank you. Any other uh, brief announcements on the liaison side? Oh, you mean the C uh, CAAP? Uh, so that's what. Uh, Professor uh, Sufi was just talking. If you have any other uh, sort of brief announcement, or we can talk in more depth on the uh, on the agenda item at the end. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone. Um, I think I want. Wait, before we get to the brief announcements, I just wanted to. Um, 
speak briefly uh, about some of the, um, the I guess, uh, changes that I'd like to trial, um, sort of the background to that. And I'll, I'll get into it more in the, in the question or on the, um, the agenda item where we're going to be talking about sort of um, process and strategy and whatnot. Um, but one of the things that I've been wanting to try out is um, keeping the presentations um, to around 15 minutes or even less uh, so that it would leave more time for us as commissioners to talk and to get to know each other, um, go through the issues. Uh, and I felt sometimes, especially when the presentations um, got on to 45 minutes, it really sort of compressed the amount of time we had. Uh, and I think one of the things I want to focus on uh, during the, the, the year I'm here, um, uh, everything willing, uh, is to try and build our relationship as a body uh, so that we, 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 we better understand sort of what our common goals and objectives are, where we're coming from, who we are, um, and to try and leverage that into to having as, as big an impact, big, as big a positive impact as we possibly can on our community. So that's where I'm coming from, and, and I guess at a high level, uh, what I'm hoping to achieve over the next uh, 12 months. Uh, and the, um, the agenda item later today will be the start of that. Um, but also as part of that, our, our, first, um, our first more regularly scheduled item uh, for the long range plan will reflect it. Um, I've uh, asked uh, Bob via Elena, if we could just keep it to the greatest hits, 15 minutes of, you know, what does he think is the most interesting pieces? Not everything. Uh, I assume everybody's read the, the document um, and is gonna come with questions and we'll hopefully have some more time to go through them. So with that, uh, let's move on to public comment. Do we have, any public comment uh, ge generally uh, for something that's not on the regular schedule? So if you have a public comment, you can press star nine on your phone or you can raise your hand on the keyboard. And if you have uh, something to say, then we can allow you to speak. But, uh, there doesn't seem to be any public comment. Can you? See if any. Can you see if there's anybody on the phone line? I'm just wondering if there's even anybody on there. Yes, I believe I can see all attendees. Yeah, there's nobody on the there's nobody on the phone. Just one person who is um, logged in. Okay. Great. Thank you. Well, let's uh, let's get uh, into it then. Um, we're now on to consent calendar. Uh, so the regular uh, items on the consent calendar, we, we sort of got um, a couple of months backed up here. So this might um, be challenging for folks to remember that back, but hopefully everybody's had a chance to go through the, uh, the meetings uh, since May, June, uh, and now July. Um, I have to fess up. Whoa, I've just lost my, oh, sorry, I'm going to put my paper. Got to love the Dells putting the mirror at the, the camera at the very bottom of the keyboard. That was, that was genius. Um, I have to fess up, I am not nearly as diligent as Donna is, and so I have not pre-read these, but I have to say, I think the staff has been doing a, a, a great job. Uh, and so anyway, I just want to just just to communicate that um, these these do not reflect uh, the, the value add that Donna's brought. So hopefully you've read them with a little bit um, closer care, uh, and let's uh, go through. Does anybody have uh, any com Oh, Donna, thank you. I do, and I want to thank Bowen so much because um, we've had lots of conversations about making the minutes really short, and I really appreciated these. I just have a couple of quick technical corrections. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Very good. I'm just going to go through them really quickly. They're really technical. On the June minutes, on page two, where you have under 6A, those who spoke, McCann, which is now spelled M-A-C-A-N, should be M-C, capital C-A-N-N. And then under B, where it says Ms. Roberts, it's Roberts hyphen Musser, M-U-S-S-E-R. And Mr. Gallen is Gellen, G-E-L-L-E-N. And then on... That's all on June, and then there's just a couple in July. Um, 
in the July minutes, in the July minutes under item six subcommittee reports, we actually disbanded the subcommittee on water and sewer excess reserves. We did it fairly informally without a motion and a vote, but we did disband that subcommittee because we knew that our work as a committee subcommittee was completed and there wasn't anything more we needed to do. So that those are my only uh, changes. Thanks, Donna. I made notes of those, and so we'll make those changes. And uh, also, uh, yeah, I, I, we definitely understand that that subcommittee could have easily been disbanded then too. I think um, we had during during our initial planning conversations, we had planned to discuss that as well. But yeah. I'm glad that you mentioned that it was at least informally done, so we can make changes to that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, on uh, page six of the June meeting minutes. Uh, just, I happen to note that when Matt Williams talked to us, um, it says that he requested the FBC to pull the item off the consent calendar. This had to do with, he raised some questions about the cost of safety crossing guards going up. That part is correct, but I don't, it doesn't seem to me I can't remember exactly what he said about that, but he, I think he was trying to urge us to ask, to join him in asking the uh, city council to pull the item off the consent calendar. I mean, we have no power over the city council's consent calendar. So it seems to me that it's, uh, and I don't remember any discussion about that issue, but I don't, I, I, it doesn't make any sense to me as written. So it should have somehow be clarified. Okay, yeah, happy to do that and uh, and see what we can do to make that a little bit more clear. If we have any more follow-up questions, I'd be happy to talk with you about it as well. It's possible that for minute purposes, you could just strike that sentence. Okay. And that would be the simple way. And, it, and since it's all past history, it won't make any difference to anybody, I don't think. Make a note of it. Okay, I'm just trying to open up that item. Uh, any other comments or edits to the, the three months of meeting of uh, minutes? Uh, hearing none. Um, We'll have to call for uh, public comment on the. You got it. Yep. All right. Let's do that and then we'll vote. Okay. So if you have a public comment to make, please press star nine on your phone or you can raise your hand through the Zoom link and uh, we will be happy to allow you to speak. Mr. Chair, I am not seeing any. All right. Can I get a motion to approve some or all of the minutes? Yeah, I'll make a motion to uh, uh, approve item 5A, 5B, and 5C on the consent calendar, the, the minutes for the meeting of, of May 9th, June 13th, July 11th, with the corrections as stated during the, the, uh, the meeting. Thank you, Commissioner Sandino. Do we have a second? I'll second, second that. it. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Jacobs. Um, I will now call the roll. Um, Commissioner Sufi? Here, uh, aye. Commissioner Sandino? Aye. Commissioner Jacobs? Aye. Commissioner Neville? Aye. Commissioner Axe? Aye. Commissioner Beeman? Aye. So it passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, uh, we are now on to the regular items, um, making good time. So this next item is the general fund long range forecast. Uh, I think the way um, I'd like to run this is we do the presentation, we do public comment, and then we do commissioner comment. Uh, so 
please, uh, Mr. Leland. All right, thank you. Now, uh, Chair Beeman and members, I'm going to go through the slides here uh, pretty expeditiously, just kind of touch on the high points. Um, I do want to note that the FBC has been a strong advocate for long range forecasting, had a major role to play, I think, in the city making a decision back in 2016 to move ahead with a long range forecast. Uh, my firm, Management Partners, uh, was brought in to do that forecast. Uh, I live in town here, so uh, it was an easy engagement to uh, have. Uh, the forecast has been updated annually ever since. Uh, there is a special section in the uh, each budget document that explains the uh, updated forecast and assumptions. And so all of you uh, should be familiar with that. Uh, particular section. Uh, I do want to note that while the model has a, a wide flexibility to assume alternate growth scenarios, uh, different assumptions, uh, there has been a, an assumption since 2016 that projected resources in excess of the reserve goal uh, would be allocated towards uh, meeting identified infrastructure funding needs. Uh, Davis is really uh, uh, gone the extra mile, I think, in terms of engaging the professional engineering studies needed to identify what the costs are for uh, streets, parks, buildings, uh, and the like. Uh, though, well, mind if I just pause you? Would you like to share your slides if you want me to advance them for you? Because we do have them as part of this. Um, slide. Uh, no, that's all right. You can see them now, right? Uh, no, they're not being presented right now. Oh, they're not. Uh, well, uh, I clicked on it. Uh, let's try this again. Um, what, Kelly, what, what's the deal here? So, Bowen, can you unshare your screen? Can you just close out? Yeah, happy to. And then, hold on, Bob, let me. Yeah, it looked like. Bowen, your, um, your host, can you make, uh, make I've sure been, Bob's yeah. Okay. Oh, make, make Bob the co -host? Yeah, I can do that. Sure. You'll have all the power, Bob. Oh, boy. Mm -hmm. Don't abuse it. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's, uh, all right. let's start this again. I'm glad somebody, because from my end, it looked like it was working. There we go. All right. You guys see it? All right. Um, so the, the, uh, the uh, forecasts assume that resources in excess of the reserve goal would go towards infrastructure. Now that's an annual call to make by the city council. I mean, there's no guarantee that 10 years from now that's going to be what happens because if if there are resources in excess of the reserve goal and the council decides to put it into uh, increased staffing or service costs, then clearly that's their prerogative. Um, we do, however, uh, do a, uh, as part of the forecast, a calculation of what the uh, unmet needs are in uh, streets, parks, uh, traffic, maintenance, uh, facilities, public buildings. And uh, based on that, uh, we allocate uh, the uh, $3 million uh, minimum amount from the general fund each year and then anything in excess of the reserve goal. So we'll have to stay tuned for uh, future years and see how that plays out. But I did want to commend staff and the commission for having an emphasis on that. Uh, most of our clients, I would say, uh, are not so engaged on infrastructure and haven't done the work to identify what their needs are. So uh, Davis has identified them and uh, is doing uh, uh, its diligent best to uh, get those needs met. So they have a plan for doing it. And I, I you know, commend you all for that. Um, just a couple of quick things on the forecast. Uh, the, the pie charts here indicate, uh, you know, property tax and sales tax uh, together are getting towards 60% of total general fund resources. Uh, in terms of expenditures, you know, personnel typically is 60 to 70%. Uh, 60% here in Davis. 
uh, after credits, it's about a $79 million uh, net expense. In the lower left-hand corner, you can see going back several years, uh, total expenditures and revenues. Uh, you can see uh, during the uh, Great Recession, things were flat or slightly down. Uh, then uh, with the recovery from the recession, we had uh, some significant growth. There's a big jump here in uh, fiscal 21, and that is due to an accounting change where uh, the uh, uh, public safety fees and park tax now flow through the general fund. So both expenses and revenues related to that are in here. So this isn't just a windfall of money. It's uh, the same money you always had, but it's accounted for now through the general fund. And what you see going forward is a green band, excuse me, that gets wider over time. And what that is, is the uh, potential uh, increase or decrease from the forecast uh, with a, a half percent a year compounded. And so it's the, it's the potential volatility uh, that seems reasonable uh, given past history. In other words, revenues are likely to be in this green zone. They could be higher than the forecast, but they could also be lower. And then the lower right-hand corner is just a focus on pension costs, uh, just because they have grown so significantly from 2001, when the state had basically uh, shut down contributions from local agencies under the theory that the plans were super funded and would never need any more contributions, that changed very rapidly with the dot-com bust investment losses. And you can see just how uh, rapidly uh, costs have increased from about a million dollars uh, 20 years ago uh, to now being uh, around $13 million. And so uh, we expect that, expect that to continue uh, over the next several years. But uh, by the late 20s, early 30s, pension costs will actually be flattening out, uh, even though we're assuming a continued cost of living increases. The uh, pension uh, costs for unfunded liabilities uh, are going to be paid down significantly. And so you will see over time a flattening and then ultimately decreasing in pension costs. And that will increase financial capacity of uh, agencies throughout California, uh, Davis included. Now to, to just uh, give you a quick comparison, <clears throat> last year's forecast uh, compared to now, on the left-hand side, you see uh, the general fund unassigned balance. And you can see that there was uh, uh, in this yellow highlighted area, uh, it's the it's a 10 to 15 percent of expense level uh, for the reserve, and you would want to be in that yellow zone. Uh, over the next several years, uh, we're assuming the economy uh, continues in good shape. Fiscal 27 was the assumed next recession, which came would come seven years after the pandemic since recessions have on average for the last 100 years uh, occurred about every seven years. And you can see the balance dips. <clears throat> it's still positive. Um, many of our clients uh, are uh, negative throughout. So even with last year's forecast dipping below the level where ideally you'd like to be, uh, it was still relatively healthy. Keeping in mind that this incorporates uh, uh, recessions every seven years in uh, 27 and then again in 34 and so on. That would have funded 56% of the uh, identified infrastructure needs. You see that the balance uh, is uh, capped at the 15% level. The reality is the balance would increase except we're taking the increase uh, beyond that and devoting it to infrastructure funding. And that's how we get to 56% funded. Now that was last year. The way things look now, it's a lot better. Uh, we were still in the throes of the pandemic at that point. Uh, sales taxes have improved significantly. We're gonna talk about that in a moment. Uh, so now uh, the forecast in July of 22 is uh, basically right at the reserve goal on an ongoing basis and more excessive reserve would exist and therefore 73% of the uh, 
uh, infrastructure would be funded. So you're definitely starting from a position of financial strength. Um, it is still assuming moderate recessions in fiscal 27 and 34. And I have some slides in here showing what happens if the recession is stronger and occurs sooner. So we're gonna just quickly go through some of the reasons for the changes in forecast. Uh, these first couple slides are um, significant changes or where there's sig significant changes in assumptions. I mentioned sales tax is stronger. So if you take a look, the red dotted line is the current forecast compared to the blue line, which is a year ago. So a couple of things going on with sales tax. One is online purchases have been much stronger, higher growth throughout the pandemic. Uh, the much feared uh, reduction in sales tax uh, back when there was uh, high unemployment uh, never really materialized. The numbers here are updated as of the first quarter of uh, fiscal uh, 22, calendar year 22. Uh, there's one other change, and that is that the sales tax consultant has been switched from Avenue Insights to HDL companies. Uh, basically, the, the two of them are the ones that provide sales tax service. And uh, HDL has a, a slightly different forecast than, than Avenue, but over time, uh, they're not terribly different. The lower chart. Pensions, uh, there are actually two big things that went on. Uh, to take a look at the chart, you'd say, well, not too much of a change over time. But uh, we had built into the forecast a um, minus 5% CalPERS return for fiscal year 22. Now, the actual turned out to be minus 6.1. So uh, we don't have that uh, factored into the forecast yet. We're going to wait till the uh, actual uh, 2021 valuation report comes out from CalPERS. But uh, we're still assuming uh, the lower 6.2% return uh, on an ongoing basis and a decline from the current discount rate, which is 6.8% to 6% over 20 years. So having that loss in investment return for fiscal 22, that hurts. Uh, that would cause costs to go up. However, there was something else that caused costs to go down. And that is that we've switched the pension cost calculation from the pension outlook model of CalPERS to the GovInvest uh, firm's projections. Uh, CalPERS, uh, the, uh, CalPERS has an online model uh, called pension outlook. It's where you get their long-term forecasts. Uh, because it is an online model and has to be immediately responsive to users that are seeking to get uh, answers from it, it is a, uh, it's done in a simpler fashion than uh, GovInvest. Uh, GovInvest firm uh, does actuarial calculations, uh, starting with the numbers from CalPERS, but over time it is a more sophisticated calculation and it is more reflective of the uh, savings that will be realized over time from classic employees with higher benefits migrating to the uh, PEPRA level with lower benefits. Uh, CalPERS does uh, one calculation in their online version. The uh, uh, GovInvest literally uh, recalculates it every year for 30 years and takes advantage of the compounding impact of the savings. And so that drives the unfunded liability costs down. And I've talked to both GovInvest and CalPERS staff and uh, they're, they're in agreement on that basic trend. So doing this, uh, it's only a one-time uh, gain. You can only pull this rabbit out of the hat once, but it does have the effect of, of uh, having lower unfunded liability costs over time, which I think is more realistic. So good news in that uh, lower uh, unfunded liability costs over time with a better projection. Bad news, last year was an investment loss. Net change up and down year to year, but overall not too much of a change. Hey, Bob, I think we're about at 15 minutes here. So if you can, uh, you seem to be reading every dot point. Um, I don't know if that, if you got any more highlights. Yeah, or... you asked for the highlights and I'm giving you the highlights. Uh, couple more minutes, okay? On the salaries, uh, we do have the uh, fire uh, truck costs uh, built in. Uh, and uh, on OPEB, the major change is that we have um, 
the a new uh, actuary uh, doing the report and we have updated information. So there is a lower uh, actuarially determined contribution level. We have factored that in. So that's about a couple million dollar savings a year over time compared to uh, the more pessimistic approach that we had before. These other items uh, basically are not much change, property tax, other O&M, uh, other revenues and infrastructure. There is change in infrastructure because that recognizes the net change of all these other factors. Uh, we stress test the uh, uh, items here. Uh, if you take a look at uh, on the left, upper left, this is the revised forecast and it's with a moderate recession uh, starting in uh, 26, ending in, in 27. Uh, at the upper right hand corner, you have what's the impact if that moderate recession moves up sooner uh, to the 23, 24 timeframe and you can see there's a greater dip. Uh, down here in the lower left, uh, what if the recession stays in 27, but it's stronger? And then finally, what if the recession is both stronger and sooner? And that is the uh, uh, situation where balance would be down significantly. Now, this is not something you can control, but it's always a good idea to run these tests and see uh, what happens with different assumptions on the economy. And then the last slide is. Again, taking a look at some things you do control, uh, which is uh, COLAs and staffing levels. Uh, the upper left-hand corner takes moderate recessions that uh, start sooner and then every seven years, and then add to it a 2.5% COLA versus the 2% that's in the forecast now. And you can see the dip in balance. If you assume the same moderate recession, but instead of the 2.5% COLAs, you add one FTE a year, it's kind of a comparable change, not, not quite as pronounced as the 2.5% COLAs. The lower left shows both, doing both 2.5% COLA and 1% FTE, I mean, one FTE a year. And uh, there you can see a pretty significant reduction in balance. And if you do all of those and assume that the recessions are strong instead of moderate, that would be enough to take you into negative territory. So that's the, uh, that's the quick overview. And so let's go ahead and open it up to questions. Thank you very much. Um, excellent material, by the way. I can't wait to look at the assumptions. I think we may uh, ask you back if that's okay once we have a chance to look at those. But for now, let's uh, let's kick it off. Um, Mishnah Sufi. Um, Ezra, just real quick. Um, did you want to do public comment first or did you want to do? Yep, no, sorry. That's it. Thank you. I, would, I think it would be good to do that first. So okay. can we open up to uh, public comment so we can take their comments into consideration? So as a reminder, if you would like to make a public comment, please press star nine on your phone. Otherwise, you can press um, the raised hand button on your Zoom link and you should be able to make a public comment. I see that we do have one public comment, uh, Mr. Chair. So it is Matt Williams and I'm gonna allow him to, to speak now. Oh, Matt. Yeah. Can you can you please uh, speak just so to make sure we can hear you? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Um, I submitted uh, in writing uh, a bunch of questions, uh, some of which Bob's presentation has uh, has said, shed some light on. Um, I, I think that that I'm not going to get into those in detail. I requested the, that the models uh, that have been run for many of these presentations starting back in 2019, uh, each of those models should be on the, the city website the same way that budgets are. Um, and uh, you know, I hope that, the, um, that the, the Finance and Budget Commission will support that transparency and education for the public. Um, I, I think that uh, I'm just gonna leave that, it will be no need to get down into the weeds on any of the specific questions because I'm sure I will get some sort of answer in writing. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Williams. Um, and I want to credit you with reminding me to ask lots of questions about the uh, the model. So thank you very much. It looks like uh, all our Christmases will be answered tomorrow. Um, are there any other? I see we've got another gentleman on the um, online. I don't know if he wants to make a comment. Yeah. If you do want to make a public comment, please just raise your hand. I'll put a star down on your phone. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any more public comment. Okay, well, let's uh, let's turn back to the commissioners then. I think um, Commissioner Sufi, you were you were first, and then Commissioner Axt, if you wouldn't mind starting. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Bob, for the presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, just a couple, perhaps semantics questions. Um, so on slide three, there's um, where the revenue range versus the expense. There's a dip in the revenues for 20, I believe it's like 23, 2023. Um, I don't see a projected dip in 23 for any of the other forecasts, like property tax, sales tax, whatnot. So I'm just curious, where does that dip come from? You know, we go up a little bit and come back down and then it evens out. So can you kind of shed a little light on that? Well, I'd have to go into the model to look at the specifics. Uh, basically, the the upward trend in 22 uh, was because of the uh, park tax and uh, uh, public safety fees and Prop 172 money now being part of the general fund. Uh, mm -hmm. And in terms of also there was... Uh, some uh, uh, CARES uh, Act and uh, uh, ARPA money uh, that could have biased uh, the, the amount in uh, 22, that th that was one time and isn't going to be repeated. So um, I'm, I'm suspecting that that's the major reason. Mm -hmm. And then also the expenses are a little higher because we there were amounts budgeted but not spent uh, in 22, and we're assuming that those are going to roll over and get spent in 23. Got it. Okay. Um, would those other, those other like um, one-time revenues fall under other revenues or other O and M in other forecasts, or how did those, how did those get accounted for? Well, it, typically we hit the high points: property tax, sales tax, uh, TOT, are amounts that we track on their own. Other other revenues tend to get put into a, an other revenue category. Gotcha, okay. Um, so now when it comes to, I really like the, um, the sensitivity analysis of the various different uh, strengths of recession. Um, when it comes to the next recession, 2023, 2024, and the strong 24, um, a strong two month or two year uh, recession, I am curious in the assumptions for the model, are we, uh, are we returning at around like 30, the year 2033 to 2035 that we are returning back to like, um, I guess pre-recession levels plus the intended growth at that point, because it just seems like a very quick jump from 33 to 35 from less than 15 to more than 15%. Um, kind of in line with, I don't know if that question is clear. I can well, the, the, the model uh, interprets the uh, recessions as a cyclical uh, event. So in during the downturn, revenues are obviously low. Uh, in the subsequent years, the, there's a recovery period. And so your annual rate of growth is going to be higher than normal as you catch up. Uh, there's usually a two or three year recovery period uh, built in so that by the time you get to the end of that period, you're, you're back to where you would have been had there not been a recession. But in our looking at recessions over time, uh, if, you, if you assume that there was no recession, that level over time is pretty much what you keep coming back to. The recoveries from recessions don't typically take you above the line where you would have been had there never been a recession in the first place. So all you do is lose when there's a recession, uh, but you do tend to catch back up to the, the sort of the natural order of things in terms of the, uh, the, the underlying growth that uh, city revenues are capable of. 
Gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Um, and then the final question for me. Um, so as we know, downtown plan is getting finished up now. And then, you know, City of Davis does not have a general plan um, that's been updated in quite some time. I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. When these are completed, how do these affect the, the model? Um, can you speak to anything about, can any of these projections still kind of be held? Um, like, can we actually, can we utilize these or how does that, how does that affect the forecast? Yeah, the, the model, uh, fiscal model is intended to link up with uh, the other plans that the city has. So let's take the general plan. Uh, out of that, there will be an absorption rate of new growth, residential and commercial, that's expected over the term of the general plan. Uh, and we can take a look at that uh, as we also take a look at the uh, 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 regional allowance for housing that is given out right now and see if those projected units uh, differ significantly from what we currently have in the forecast. And, you know, we would update it based on, on that new information. Um, we also ask the planners to give us information about what's in the pipeline right now, uh, what's under construction that is going to hit the assessment rolls within the next year or so, uh, what has been approved but hasn't been started yet, and where there are applications uh, and that's a longer term uh, horizon because they haven't you know, gotten their planning approvals yet. So we look at that at the near term, and then we would look at, at an updated general plan over the long haul. Gotcha. All right. Um, if there's time, I'll have one at the end, but we're good. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Axe, please. Um, I'm very glad to see the improved financial capacity for the city. I have two questions. The first is about the pension cost. And you mentioned that pension cost will flatten out in 2030s, eventually a decrease. So what are the reasons for the decrease of pension costs? Yeah, many years ago, uh, CalPERS, uh, handled their uh, unfunded liability costs in a different way. Now, uh, pension costs uh, come in two types. One is a normal cost, which is what it costs to uh, meet your uh, ongoing liabilities. And then what it costs to pay for amounts that you should have collected in prior years, but didn't. And so that's like a debt. And it used to be that uh, CalPERS would pay only a minimum amount towards unfunded liability each year, kind of like paying a minimum on your credit card. And when you do that, you never pay the credit card off. But uh, a few years back, some of the reforms that they adopted were to uh, adopt fixed amortization periods, sort of like a, a mortgage for given uh, chunks of unfunded liability. And so they're now being paid off over a fixed time frame, And because that's the, the case, uh, when you get a certain uh, amortization basis paid off over 20 or 25 years, uh, then you're done with it. Uh, and what's going to happen is that these large amounts of unfunded liability that have built up are going to be paid off pretty much by the 2030s. And so as that happens, uh, you're just paying normal costs and you don't have any more unfunded liability in theory. And so based on the projections that they and GovInvest have put together, uh, you see a flattening out of pension costs. It's not something we're used to seeing in, in over the last 20 years, all we've seen is rapid increases in pension costs, but there were fixed reasons for that and they all related to unfunded liability. And once you get that off CalPERS's books, then um, that, that cost goes away and it actually frees up uh, fiscal capacity to uh, spend on something other than pension costs. I remember I read somewhere the new hires uh, don't have the same level of pension as some old um, hired many years ago. Is that That's true? true? That is true. The uh, Public Employees Pension Reform Act uh, back in 2013 started a phase in where uh, new employees would get the lower level of benefits. And so that has grown uh, over the last uh, 
uh, several years to the point where uh, many cities now, a majority of their employees uh, are getting the lower level of benefit. And so uh, that is going to uh, create ongoing savings uh, and help force unfunded liability costs down. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. The second question is uh, uh, a quick question. The, for the stress tests you did, uh, what, is, what are the initials for COLA, C-O-L-A, and the FTE? Oh, sure. Uh, COLA is cost of living adjustment. So the annual inflationary adjustment that uh, public employees may get uh, under their uh, labor agreements. And FTE is full-time equivalent. So mm -hmm. in other words, that's a, a 1.0 is equivalent to one person working a full year. If you had two half-time employees, the 0.5 and 0.5 would add up to 1.0. So uh, that's just a way of expressing uh, personnel costs in terms of a whole full-time person. So the worst scenario is 2.5 cost of living adjustment and plus one full-time equivalent growth. Right. And, you know, that doesn't sound like a lot, does it? Because yeah. with inflation being what it is now, you think, oh, two and a half percent, that sounds reasonable. But the problem is the revenues aren't growing fast enough to sustain in, in uh, colas of three or four percent a year. So even two and a half pushes the balance down. And one FTE a year, again, doesn't sound like a lot but it adds up over time. It's, you know, by the end of 20 years, it's 20 extra employees. And so I guess the good news there is that the forecast uh, without the extra uh, recession impacts uh, and without the extra uh, FTE or COLAs looks pretty stable, but that's just for the status quo. So, I mean, it's a good thing to be okay at the status quo because many, many cities you look at are going into deficit on a status quo budget. Davis is not, but it just shows the limits that uh, revenues will only stretch so far. And if you if you push cost of living adjustments higher and you add staff, ultimately that will push your balance into negative territory. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, Paul, uh, Commissioner Jacobs. Yeah, Bob, a uh, question on when you calculate percent infrastructure funded in these various scenarios, the stress tests in particular, do you, have you taken into account the uh, American Recovery Act money that some of which might go uh, partly, I, I don't know what part of it will go to uh, infrastructure and uh, also the Infrastructure Act passed uh, what, a year and a half ago, that uh, some of which is filtering down uh, to the city. Did you take those, do we know those amounts that actually apply to infrastructure? And did you take that into account in coming up with this percentage? In other words, our need might go down a little bit. Yeah, yeah, uh, the answer is yes. Uh, we, there's a little bit of lag time. Uh, we, we update the model as the amounts are actually being spent. So in some cases, the city has an intention to do something, but until it actually hits the books as an expense, we don't factor it in. But yes, we do update it over time. So uh, other revenue sources, such as grants like that, that go toward the infrastructure will help out. You're on mute. <clears throat> You're muted, Paul. Oh, yeah. that was my only question. And thanks again, Bob. Sure. I, I think these are really important. This forecast is really important. And uh, I've, I've found it very informative. Uh, if you just look at one year at a time, I think you can get in big trouble with this so, in running a city. Thank you. Sure. I, I wholeheartedly agree. So. Anybody else want to ask any questions? Otherwise, I'll, I've got a few questions. Oh, great, David. I'm adjusting here, so uh, thank you, Mr. Leland. Um, I, I'm interested in, in the policy implications of your forecast 
and then I have uh, some technical questions, but not digging into the model, just trying to read your, your chart. So let me start with the, the, the policy question. So what, what do you see as, as the major takeaways from your presentation today that will uh, be of, of relevance to the, to the city council as they, as they move forward and trying to deal with this information? Well, as I, as I was mentioning, um, it's the good news, bad news is that good news uh, at a status quo level of spending uh, that the city is in pretty good shape. Its reserves are adequate to uh, help withstand uh, a harder uh, knock that might come from a future recession. The bad news is that there really is not a uh, sufficient resource to put um, uh, into uh, significant changes, improvements in services. So it would be uh, problematic to continue adding ongoing staff to improve services in certain areas that weren't otherwise paid for by revenue they might generate like program fees. Uh, if it's coming out of the general fund balance, uh, you can only go so far. So I think the policy implication of that is, uh, is good to know. The other that I mentioned at the beginning is that we have made a policy assumption that uh, excess of reserve level resources will go into funding infrastructure, but that's not written in stone. Uh, each council makes its own priorities and in any given year, there may be a need to uh, put more money into services. And if that's the case, then uh, some of the anticipated uh, resource that we see in the later years of the forecast being available to go into infrastructure might not in fact make it there. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just that there are a lot of uh, competing needs and in any given year, uh, a council will have to decide whether to put any extra resources into services or infrastructure. So that's just something to watch. Yeah, thank you for for uh, for summarizing that. And you did say uh, those things at the beginning, but now I have a better understanding of them. So I appreciate that. Uh, so let let me ask then on on the good news on slide four. If I if I pick this up on infrastructure funding, uh, the difference from the June 2021 forecast and the July 2022 for forecast is that there's an increase, uh, at least of, uh, looks like an increase in. Uh, infrastructure and the percent funded is that right? Fifty-six to seventy-three percent is a That's change correct. in the forecast. Yeah, and and the reason why is that although it's sort of invisible on here, if you look at on the left for the June twenty-one but forecast, Bob, you, um, this the regular city slides are up. Um, I think Bowen needs to stop sharing before your stuff will pop up. Yep, my apologies. Yeah, you want to put on slide four. Well, we can share your screen now, unless you want me to just share. Oh, okay, I can, I can share mine, that's fine. Uh, so that's slide four. So on the left, you see the where you see the balance hitting this top red line, that, uh, like I said, that, that's where we uh, take any resource that would be in excess of this, and it goes toward infrastructure. And the amount that's in excess of that plus the 3 million a year that's being put in already uh, would fund 56%. Now you see over on the right, you see uh, many more years where you are at the uh, maximum or, uh, uh, or the, the reserve goal, uh, the top end of the reserve goal. And so in all of these years, there are amounts that are actually in excess of this, but we're diverting them into paying for infrastructure. And so that's, since there's more money going into it, that's how you get up to the 73%. Um, so uh, yes, definitely there, you know, you can, you could realize uh, as much as a 73% uh, based on the costs as they're currently projected. And I have to say, you know, those get updated every couple of years. And so those numbers will go up or down, uh, but they're unlikely to exactly hit the 73 over time. And of course, uh, the city's finances are constantly changing. And so 
uh, as the actual outcome looks more like the left as opposed to the right, it's gonna bring that infrastructure funding level down. And then again, as I said, uh, the money that's in excess of the reserve goal, council's gonna take a look at that on a year by year basis. That's right. that's right. and, and if some of it goes to services, then that's not gonna be available for infrastructure. Yeah, yeah so I appreciate that. And, and so to me, that's another positive that, that's in your presentation that's worth highlight, highlighting and my accolades to um, the council and, and the folks on the commission before myself that help with that. Can, uh, Mr. Chair, may I have just five more minutes? I had a couple more questions. If not, I'll stop. No, that's one of the reasons I wanted to have the presentation shorter to give us more time to talk. So okay. I think- right. uh, Thank you. I have one as well, so keep going, please. So could, uh, could we move to uh, back to slide three? Forecast yeah. highlights. I'll let you keep sharing. Okay, thank you. I can see it. So, uh, um, so uh, Mr. Leland, on on that uh, slide in, in the bottom right hand corner, you had you were talking with Commissioner Axe about total pension costs. So, um, is this a slide to look at that going into the future? It looks like um, um, less of the general fund is going to be committed to pension costs, which would be another highlight another positive, as you mentioned, which would potentially uh, allow uh, those that money that's being used for pensions costs now to be used for something else. And what I'm seeing is we're almost at that at that uh, cap, that ceiling, if that's the case. Yeah, that's why I put the two different um, uh, sort of axes on here, one to show the uh, percent of total general fund expense. And so you can see right now we're sort of in the 17, 18% range and that may go up a little bit more, but then it's gonna be dropping below 15% by the end of the forecast period. Um, a lot of cities are in the 18 to 20% range. And so uh, there's nothing unique about Davis in that regard. But uh, as you see, the, the costs flatten out, actually since the rest of general fund expenses will be going up, then this amount as a percent of the total will will drop and that's reflected here so if we stay the course and this is uh this is more good news the way i would see it so okay let me let me one more question then stay on that slide so this is uh very basic but uh i, I need to better understand if you look at the at the bottom left you have revenue range versus expenditures and then right above it, you have the two slides on revenues to the left and expenditures to the left, to the right. How is that factored into uh, that slide at the bottom where you start at uh, 2007 and, and then go to the current date, 2022, and then you project to 2039? Help me out. How is, how is that graph filled in from 2007 to 2022? Is that are those slides above in 2022? Are they incorporated? Yeah, they are. At, point? at uh, 2022 is right right here uh, on the on the chart, and so the the red line at 22 is 78.7 million, and that's the amount over here from the uh, uh, the expense. Uh, there's a gross expense of about 86 million. There are uh, almost eight million dollars in credits, which are recoveries from other funds under the cost allocation plan, and that brings the net down to uh, just uh, just under seventy nine million. So that's where the red line is here. And although I don't have a total on uh, revenues, uh, it's basically about the same amount in twenty two. Okay, so for twenty twenty two and before, it's. It's the actual amount and from 2022 onto the future, that's where the model comes in and you're making your forecasts. That's right. And that's why I started showing this uh, range of green. Uh, it's not that expenses might not uh, change as well, but expenses tend to follow the revenue you have available. And so if there's more revenue available, it will get spent. If there's less revenue available, ultimately it, you know, you have to curtail spending. So I'm just giving you this uh, 
uh, idea of what a, a, a half a percent a year in growth compounded looks like over time uh, in terms of what the revenues would wind up being either greater than or less than uh, the current forecast. And since that compounding, uh, the variance gets wide, <clears throat> wider over time, you see that there's a, a much greater variance out here in uh, you know, 2040 than there is uh, currently. Okay, one last question, and then uh, appreciate the time. So, uh, so you started this model in um, 2016, I think was the first slide. Right. So we've had, um, I think I have that right. We have now five, uh, five to six years of actual um, implementation. How how did things turn out from, let's say, your first model year in 2016? How did the how have your forecasts gone in terms of their accuracy or uh, <laughs> well can you comment on that sure uh you know one thing uh about models is the numbers never sleep they are always changing and but the, the advantage of a model uh if you have something like this where you can readily adapt to new information uh you will uh as, as the new information comes in you'll account for that uh, we don't just have a, a static forecast and say we're sticking to it no matter what. So as uh, new information comes in, the model changes. So I would say at certain points in time, it's been relatively accurate. At other points in time, especially with the pandemic, it wasn't. But then nobody's was. Uh, nobody had a, a good sense of where we were going in 2020 and 2021. And things have begun to get a little more stable now. Um, you know, the same goes with recessionary periods. Um, you know, the hardest time to forecast is at, at both the beginning and the end of, of a recession. And so there, there are always uh, challenges. <laughs> uh, but uh, again, one of the advantages of being able to constantly update it, and the city has been good about that. Um, so we have constantly updated it for going on year seven now. Uh, it, that, uh, you know, that, that kind of information uh, will will give you a, a greater degree of comfort, especially as you run sensitivity analyses and say, look, given these assumptions, this is where we'll be. Uh, certain things can occur that are beyond our control, like PERS investment losses, uh, other things like uh, labor negotiations and uh, uh, staffing levels are much more within your control. So we just uh, will update it as uh, the story changes. Okay, well, thank you for uh, your your presentation and addressing uh, my questions, Mr. Leland. I'll I'll take it. I'll take your last one. Is it looks like it's been helpful and this is a, a good forecasting tool. So thank you and thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, that's it for me. Thanks for all those questions. Appreciate it, um, Commissioner Sufi. You had another. You had one question. You were holding off on. Yes, so a uh, quick one. Um, so it happens to come down to the Calvers investment loss. Um, so this year it was down six percent. Um, kind of the markets were down ten to twenty percent, depending on the index. Um, do you think that going and saying for twenty twenty three we're gonna have go back to a positive six percent return is a little bit of a rosy outlook on mm -hmm. on that, given how big of an effect the pension funding has on the general fund? Well, historically. Um there tends to be a, a better year following the year that was down. Now, sometimes you have years uh, like during the Great Recession where there were a couple of bad years in a row, uh, but tend uh, probably uh, the, the investment return next year, all things being equal, would be uh, higher than the discount rate, which is 6.8%. So what Kelper is saying with the discount rate is that on average, they think they're going to uh, yield 6.8% a year. And, uh, but the reality is that the Kelper staff and also their outside investment advisor, Wilshire Associates, have projected that unless the uh, composition of the Kelper's investment port portfolio changes, uh, they would estimate 6.2% as being a more likely outcome. And 6.2% is the growth rate that we have built into this forecast. Uh, the model does allow you to pick 
either the CalPERS actuarial assumptions, which is 6.8% discount rate and investment return, or it, what we've done is we've taken the lower 6.2% and assumed also that the discount rate continues to slowly uh, decline because it's it was 8.75% 40 years ago, and it is steadily uh, over time uh, bumped its way down to now 6.8%. And uh, based on the trend of the last 40 years, in 20 years, they'd be at 20. Uh, they, at, at the end of 20 years, they would be at 6%. And so that's what we have built into the, into the forecast. So yeah, we, we can't control any of that. Uh, it does have a significant impact on pension costs. And, uh, and so again, the model can test the sensitivity of different assumptions, but the, the council and the commission have always wanted to be conservative and not adopt the uh, CalPERS assumption, but to back off of that to something more conservative. And that's what we've done. Nice, okay. And so just a small little extra footnote to that. Um, over the last five, 10, 15 years, how consistently has CalPERS actually hit their target growth? Has it been historically consistently <laughs> under or has no, it been? No, actually uh, over. Uh, well, it, but it depends on the time period. If you pick a certain number of years, include a downturn, obviously they won't have made it there. But if you look at the last 30 or 40 years, they, they have exceeded uh, the amount. But you ask, how are they? How good are they at hitting it? Well, in terms of exactly hitting it, they've never exactly hit it and probably never will. But uh, they're generally over or under. Uh, in the main, they've been a little bit over, but the problem is, is that when they go under, it's like really under, <laughs> and it. then it takes time to recover. Okay, that answers my questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think everybody's spoken except Donna. You, do you have any questions? I do not. Thank you. All of my questions were asked and answered. Great. Okay, I've got a couple um, that haven't been asked yet. Um, so on slide two, I, it, was, it was really nice to have the acknowledgement about how um, much support I think the commission well before I got here uh, has had for the long-term forecasting model. Um, so appreciate that. I, I think I'd like to add uh, under forecasting and fund, uh, sorry, strong advocate for long range forecasting um, and funding uh, infrastructure. I think one of the, the things we're trying to focus on today as well is, uh, is, is delivery of that infrastructure. And we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, yeah, which wasn't actually a question. The first question uh, is on slide three. Um, you, uh, one of the things you haven't spoken of, uh, or at least I wasn't hearing it, is inflation. How does inflation play into all of this? Uh, my quick sort of... Um, uh, thoughts on it are that um, generally inflation is going to make uh, a fixed pension um, easier to fund. Uh, it's also going to increase the property tax returns because everybody's house went up by like 30% in the last two years. Um, and I felt it was interesting that in your sort of before and after, you, you have sales tax as one of the key differences, but you don't have property tax. So, sorry, that was a three part question. Well, uh, Bob, I'll let you share your slides too, if you if you. Want oh, to, okay. If we do that. Well, um, onto the the, the uh, property tax. Here we go. Uh, the property tax forecast is pretty consistent, uh, the one we have now, with what was there before. It is slightly higher over time, and that's due to improved uh, performance in terms of assessment values. And uh, it's true, uh, the property tax has been looking pretty bulletproof. Uh, now, that wasn't the case during uh, the Great Recession, but that was a complete collapse of the housing credit market. And... Uh, what's been happening now, uh, the real estate market's been softening a lot of places in the country uh, due to higher interest rates, which are making it uh, less affordable for uh, people depending on their income level. And so, uh, but Davis property values have still uh, been holding up pretty well. Uh, the, the volatility has been in the sales tax and the uh, chart 
that we were showing here uh, uh, reflects the same economic downturns that you see the little ripples in the line, but overall that line is higher. And uh, you know, part of it is that uh, Davis has got uh, uh, a high performing uh, uh, sales tax, uh, the local voter approved tax, the transaction and use tax, uh, the uh, online purchases are allocated by location of the purchaser as opposed to location of the cash register. So uh, the city winds up uh, actually collecting more uh, from its one cent local sales tax than it does from its share of the one cent statewide sales tax. And these lines here are the combination of the two. So, uh, you know, Davis has been doing uh, pretty well on sales tax. How much of that shift, though, is due to the change in consultants? It's not clear to me uh, what the change, what the shift, like what uh, that line was with the old ones. Yeah, well, that's hard to compare because uh, uh, once the switch was made, we don't have an updated estimate uh, for yeah. Davis from Avenue Insights. But I would say minor, uh, the bulk of its economic activity. Okay. Maybe I can rephrase the question, the other the inflation question. What forecast for inflation do you have? And I guess I'm happy to hear that we use the World Bank inflation forecast too. Well, the, the forecast that we have, uh, and again, these are costs that are affecting uh, general fund services. And so the fact that food is up is not really an issue. Uh, the colas are negotiated, and so it depends on what's ultimately negotiated. If you negotiate higher colas, then those will ultimately be factored in. But on a long-term basis, for 20 years, the Fed has been assuming 2%. We've assumed 2%. We know it'll vary uh, occasionally, uh, and there is pent-up demand. And so the city, obviously, and its uh, uh, labor negotiations, taking a look at what's happening to sort of household inflation, is gonna be under some pressure to, to give more. But if you're a city and you're looking at inflation, uh, you've got uh, you know, consultant costs, you've got uh, infrastructure costs, and actually infrastructure costs have gone up a lot. Uh, the construction cost index has really taken off over the last year. And so when it comes to building uh, you know, doing street repaving or doing other types of projects, that would have an impact but that's not a direct impact on the general fund. So the bulk of general fund goes for people and then most of the services, uh, you know, we're again, assuming that two, 2% 2 range. If uh, you can show in the model uh, inflation going up and if you assume that inflation is higher then that will also boost some of the revenue uh, forecasts uh, that we have as well, as well as driving expense. But we're not assuming that this inflation is a long-term impact, not, not like it was in the 70s and 80s. And you raise a great point here, which is as soon as we get our hands on the model, we can just run our own scenarios and sort of see what the effect is. Look, I, I'm, I, I don't want to go too long. One question I have, though, because it really speaks to uh, how rosy are things. If you go to slide four, where you show us June 21 versus July 22, um, it says infrastructure is 73% funded. Now, uh, my understanding is that for, we used to have a slide that sort of showed us the overs and unders getting paid into, into infrastructure. But I guess my question is just, what does that sentence mean? I think it means that over the period, 73% of the infrastructure need is funded, which means we accrue an additional 27% of debt, unfunded liability over that period. Now it's better than it was, but we're still not paying away. Is that is that? Oh right? yeah. I mean, well, absolutely. And and just to be clear, the uh, uh, a lot of that's backloaded because as you look at those charts, you can see that the years where the balance uh, meets and would otherwise exceed the reserve goal are in the late twenties and in the thirties. So it's not like that money is available right now. Uh, it will accumulate to the point where it becomes available in those later years. But by, uh, by the end of the forecast period, 2041, you're looking at a, a, you know, the, the, the 56 versus the 73%. And again, don't get wedded to those numbers because 
every every time we update the model, things change. They'll go up or down. I'm a fellow forecaster, so sympathetic to some of the questions <laughs> okay. that you had to carry. Um, online purposes, okay. Uh, so one other comment I'd make is even if we had all this stuff going, all this, ex all this additional funds to need going into infrastructure, I think one of the key challenges is can we spend it? Um, and that's, that's one of the, the, the other challenges that we face uh, is even if we do have funding, if it's uncertain, if it's variable, it's really, really tough to spend uh, in, a, in an efficient fashion. Anyway, that was more of a comment. Again, you know, great model. Uh, great to get the update today. Uh, look forward to seeing all the detail. And I do, uh, depending on what sort of, um, what we find when we do go through the model, there may, it would, may be good to have you back uh, before your normal 12 month cycle, but we'll, we'll see how we go. So okay. I, I wanna say thank you personally. Hey, I did wonder actually put it to the rest of the group. Uh, do we think, that, and I don't know if you need to stick on for this, uh, Mr. Leland, um, but I thought some of the motions we might consider are, um, you know, thanking staff for um, making the latest one updated and to um, recommend this level of transparency going forward. Does anybody feel like do we want to make a statement as a group that this is a good thing and should be commended and supported? You can say no to. Would you like to uh, phrase a motion and we can, we can go ahead and second or otherwise? Yeah, I, I'm happy because there's no like, yeah, I, I did wonder the, the chair can make motions, right? Um, so I think I'd like to move that the commission, um, well, oh, uh, thank Mr. Leland and thank staff um, for Mr. Leland for the, for the presentation and the, um, and the model itself and for keeping it up to date and his insights, et cetera. Um, but staff for making it public after, I think it's been five years, right? And that we strongly support A, the maintenance of a long-term model uh, and, the, and, and making it, uh, keeping it up to date as really important to the public discourse. I'm going to stop there because the first half, I think we can truncate and it was really just that last bit. Does that qualify as a motion? Like what, I don't know quite the details, like does a motion need to have an actionable or is it just saying that like, yes, we are looking, we would like more documents to be readily available. Is that the motion? I don't know if Kelly can weigh in on this one so the commission um i mean you can you can say whatever you want in a motion so if you want a motion simply to be a statement um that's fine um particularly if it's a motion that you're perhaps or a statement that you're perhaps wanting to forward to the city council um if you have a specific action you're specifically asking for staff to do X, um, you know, that would be helpful to, uh, to pull that out a little bit. This doesn't really look like, um, basically it looks like stay the course. Well, how about this? Rec I, I motion uh, to recommend a council um, continue to support making uh, the long range, the updated long range model available to the public. Which I is a pat on the back happening. <laughs> All right, do I need to read it again or can we? Oh, Donna, I probably messed up here. You muted Donna. No, I was just waiting for a second and then I wanted to make a comment. Okay, so we have a second. So now let's open it up for discussion. Yeah, I'm, I'm a little confused and puzzled by the need for a motion. Um, the council's been really clear about its commitment to doing the long range forecasting. And it would just seem to me that our minutes could simply reflect that we appreciated the presentation. 
and are in support of continuing to do the long range plan. I just don't see what, the need for a motion or anything to go to council on this. Okay. Thank you, uh, David. That's parallel to my my question. Uh, so I, I'm not clear on the current thinking uh, by council um, re relating to this, but it sounds like Donna knows that. And uh, so if the current thinking is that annual updated updates to this forecasting model is something that's already supported by the city, um, I'm I I I okay with what Donna suggests. I'm also okay with us weighing in that after the discussion this year, we think that policy uh, makes sense to continue for the foreseeable future, whatever that is, the next few years. And then the other um, part of your motion, Ezra, which I'm, 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 I'm ignorant on is to what uh, is available now to the public uh, and whether or not any of this information is proprietary, my guess it is not, but if it's already available to the public in a way that's useful or adequate, then that's another thing we could support if, uh, if we desire, which I'm, I'm willing to support. So, but I don't know the answer. Others may know Donna or yourself. So the first time the, 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 the model was made public uh, was, I think, four or five years ago, uh, and it hasn't been updated. So uh, that may qualify as useful. It certainly was at the time. I'd say less so now. All right. So is there any downside to making a suggestion that it gets up updated to reflect the current uh, model? And I'm, I'm interested in comments from staff or, or, or Mr. Leland or others on the commission. Okay, uh, let's, let's let Dan, uh, Dan go, please. He's got, yeah, Dan. Sure, I, I just wanted to mention that the question did come up about the council's interest in, in this long range effort. And I can demonstrate that when we were considering the, the mid-year budget update in June, uh, I made the suggestion and my council colleagues supported the request that we get a, an updated uh, forecast. And also I would mention that uh, at the time, uh, Josh uh, Chapman and I uh, supported the idea of that that updated long range forecast coming before this commission for your review and consideration uh, to help inform council to evaluate where is our city financially, what happens next, you know, what what should we think about? And so I very much appreciate the time you've devoted to this tonight. And as always, I appreciate the expert work of Mr. Leland and the work by our staff to bring this to you. Thanks, Dan. I, oh, sorry, Councilman Carson, I'll get it. Um, look, just in responding to your uh, query, Donna, I think um, the reason I thought it would be worth taking that extra step and, and agreeing a motion uh, was to recognize uh, a that it's a good it's a good thing that we have this, and to also put ourselves on the record as saying this shouldn't be a one off. I don't. There's no plan as far as I know that this is going to happen every year. Um, maybe it won't happen another five years. So if we can play a role to say we think this is a, a really good thing and uh, it should be you know actively supported, you know maybe that's something that should just be part of should be expected moving forward. That's what I was trying to set up. That's great. I just I didn't understand that. So if if the idea is that FBC wants to express its support for the an, the annual production of the long range forecast, that might be great. That would be a possible motion. Okay, uh, Commissioner Sufi. I just like to echo the question that David brought up. Is um is there any downside? to there being this, this information being there every year, or is it something that would only be beneficial? If anyone has anything to weigh in on that. I don't have any additional comments on that in terms of the negative effects. Um, uh, Kelly, I don't know if you have any other thoughts on that. 
So the past, since we started the model, um, I do think it's become somewhat systemic. Council now expects it. Uh, I assume this commission expects it or would, would like to see it every year. Um, as Bob Leland already indicated, we do or he does update it um, when there are there's new information to be able to put into it. Uh, we don't have any plans to not do that going forward. Um, I think it is now part of what we do. If this commission wants to uh, reinforce that, um, that is you know that is certainly a, a piece of information that we can share with council. Uh, David. Kelly, I, I understand that the, about the annual updates, is that information made publicly available, how, how the model has changed? So we've put, uh, so I think the current model, uh, I think the current year that's on the website is 2019, if I'm correct. Um, and we do have an update to put on there. We can continue putting it on there. We took a little while um, initially when it was first started to try to figure out how to um, get the information that we needed to up there um, without disclosing information that is confidential. And that's primarily employee specific, you know, health information, et cetera, that is part of the overall model. So yes, <laughs> I guess is the short answer to your question. Um, Bob? Yeah, I just wanted to emphasize again that in each year's budget document, there is an entire chapter devoted to the forecast, which is sometimes 20, 25 pages long. So the forecast is updated publicly. There's a difference between a write-up on the forecast and the model itself. And there's a, a streamlined version of the model that has been periodically posted on the city's website. And my understanding is, is that that's gotten out of date. Uh, I've sent the city uh, uh, an update for last year's budget. So in other words, the, uh, the June of 2021 that we were looking at, and also the, the, the one that's the, the July of 2022. So those two uh, could be posted. But I just uh, wanted you to remember that there is a big write-up in the budget that goes through all the assumptions and a lot of charts and a lot of detail, uh, detail forecast numbers in there. Thank you, uh, David. Uh, thank you, Mr. Leland. So, so that answers my question. I, I was talking specifically about, about the model, not the budget um, analysis, uh, which is helpful, but I'm, I'm getting the sense there are folks in the public that uh, do like models and would like to, Play with the model or look at the assumption. So that's why, if it's okay to put in the model, make it available to the public as it becomes update, I, I would think that would be a plus as long as it's protecting the confidential information that Kelly mentioned and doesn't have any proprietary information uh, unique to Mr. Leland's firms. So I would favor that. I will tell you, I'm not going to be one who's going to be playing with the model and, and testing assumptions. But I know there's there's people out there in the public that might, and I see that as a plus because it takes away any any argument that there's something not quite right about the model or we're hiding something. So that would be my my recommendation to consider that as an option. Thank you, Commissioner Sandino. Commissioner X. Oh uh, yeah, is that my turn? Okay. Um. Yeah, from my perspective, I feel this year, probably next year, will be years of volatility. So I personally would like to see an update next year, 2023. Um, going forward, I'm not sure about it. It really depends on volatility in the market. So, so I would like to see an update next year. I think the model is generally updated. So, um, and appreciate your your comments. Uh, the motion I was I was putting forward was to ensure that when the model is updated, that the updated model is made available in its simplified form for others to examine. Just to be clear. And and that motion 
I believe was seconded and yes. is on the and is on the on the floor. Yeah. So Commissioner X, I'm not I think she Yeah, I, I my point is um I can't speak for the public. I just speak from the perspective of this committee. I feel for us, maybe an annual updated model would be helpful. At least, you know, when we have time, if someone has time and we could um, really uh, look, uh, go go in there and uh, try to find some details um, in depth. So, so I, 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 I I feel like for our committee, maybe, um, you know, each year the the pop, the, the the model updates, updated model might be helpful. Thank you. Okay, um, <clears throat> uh, Commissioner Jacobs. Yeah, I, I support the motion that the model that is posted and made public uh, be updated regularly, the streamlined model in an interest of transparency, although I think few people outside this commission, well, there will be some for sure, we know some of those people very well, um, will wanna look at it and examine it. So I support the, the motion pretty much as Kelly state, just stated it. I thought she stated it very well that we'd like to see uh, the, we applaud the effort to uh, to uh, do an annual uh, financial forecast for the city, and we would like to see the, uh, the the model, the streamlined version of the model, updated as soon as it could be. And by the way, I think anything that's sent to us is public, so we might as well make it general and public. And uh, so I would support that motion, which I think is pending. Uh, Commissioner uh, Nibble. You're, you're on mute. Yeah, I, I'm <laughs> sorry if I'm over uh, analyzing this, but there's a huge distinction to me between the model and the forecast. And we keep using the terms interchangeably. And in the past, when this commission has asked to see the model, we have been told that it is proprietary and it cannot be disclosed publicly. So I am just wanna make sure maybe that position has changed and now there is a willingness to disclose the actual model, which would include basically the back end. What are all the assumptions? What are all the things that are playing into this? Um, and that's fine if that's, that's the understanding, but I just wanna be sure we know what we're actually talking about and voting on. Are we talking about the model? Or are we talking about the forecast that derives from the model? So the original motion was around the model. Now it is the public, the published model, which is locked, and you can really only mess with the inputs and see the outputs. And I'm, I was not intending to ask for the proprietary model for all kinds of reasons. So it, it is a simplified one, but up till now, okay. we, we've only had the one from 2019, which is better than I even thought it was. Okay, and that's been made publicly available, the actual model? It is the, posted on our website. Okay, very good. Okay, so I, I see what you're saying now, but we still don't know what the of assumptions are that feed into the model, you would just be able to enter different data into the model, different revenue, different expenditures, different colas. That would be pretty much what you would be limited to doing. Is that right? Right. Okay. I see. I see what you're describing now. Muted. So there, there is a motion on the floor. Um, would it be helpful to restate the? If I, yeah. Please. <laughs> sure. Um, Commissioner Beeman moved with a second by Commissioner Sufi that the commission thank Mr. Leland and staff for the presentation and the model and for making it public. The commission further supports the annual maintenance of the model and keeping it up to date for transparency and the public discourse. We need to wordsmith that just a little bit, but that's the the gist of it. I'm look, it's we're at eight ten, so um, the vote. 
let's put it to the vote. Um, so, Commissioner Tupi. Aye. Commissioner Sandino. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Neville. Aye. Commissioner Axt. Aye. Commissioner Beeman, aye. So it passes uh, unanimously. Thank you all. And thank you again uh, to Mr. Leland and to staff. I, I'm really happy with, with everything. Thanks. It was good talking with you all. Take care. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, it's 11.18 uh, at the moment. So we're, I think, about um, 30 minutes behind where we uh, have planned to be in the um, in the agenda, but that's okay. What I would like to do, rather than spending uh, 45 minutes on just sort of taking a step back and talking about, you know, why we're here, what we're trying to do, what do we want to do, what can we do, uh, I thought maybe I would go through um, the, the the process and sort of volunteer uh, to to go first to sort of give everybody an example of, of what I'm hoping to to, to talk about and. Um, Maybe we'll just Mr. Chair, before okay. you go in that, would you like to have public comment first or would you like to say that to the end? I think I think we might save it to the end because I don't know if the public, although I could be wrong. Uh, no, the other person dropped off. Um, I just don't know that there's enough that they would want to make a comment at this stage. So sure yeah. please, no, thank you for doing that. And, and please uh, remind me if I uh, run on, try and run on to the next. Uh, section. Okay, so, and I'll start by saying, uh, you know, I, I don't, um, I know very little about a lot of the folks on this commission, and uh, that's regrettable. I know when people come on, they sort of do a little bit of an intro. I think I wasn't here when Commissioner Axe, for example, joined us, um, and I think it's really useful and important uh, that we get to know each other a bit better. Um, we don't have commission mixers. I don't even know if that's legal. Uh, and so I would like, but I would, I think it's really important. One of the things I do, I'm a, I, I'm a, um, a strategy consultant. So I work with a lot of executive teams uh, to help them develop, you know, their shared visions uh, and, and their strategies for achieving those visions. And so I would like to do just a little bit of that with this group um, and, and see if that might help us um, work more effectively together and, and maybe, um, have a, a, a wider scope of shared purpose. Uh, and so to that end, there's a couple of strategies. And again, I'm putting this out there, right? This is, this is we're a group, we need to make decisions collectively. Um, I'm just trying to put some, some ideas and some, um, some suggestions out there. Uh, and, and I, you know, depending on, on the reaction, and I have had a couple of meetings with folks, mostly to get people's sort of, um, uh, get input about what they're, you know, what they want to do and what they think are good ideas. And I'd like to meet with everybody at some stage just to sort of get to know everybody a bit better, generally not talking about specific stuff. Um, but this is a, a chance to sort of, I guess, talk about specific stuff uh, with a purpose. And that purpose is how do we collectively um, make as big a positive contribution to our community through this committee as we, as we possibly can. Um, okay. So this uh, somewhat cryptically labeled item of strategic procedural planning of the commission work um, had a number of things like expectations about how much effort we can really sort of put in, um, identifying you know, key th threats and opportunities that we, we wanna focus on strategically um, and potentially establishing um, some, some, some suggestions on, on things we might wanna take forward. Uh, what, how I'd actually like to run this uh, and I'm just trying to find my piece of paper where I my thoughts. Oh. Right. That's all right. Okay. So what I'm, what I would like everybody to do, if it's all right, uh, is to just talk a little, um, and this isn't for now, right? This will be for next time, but I wanna go through uh, how I'd like to run the st so-called strategic planning session next time. And then we can have a discussion about, you know, does that sound okay? How do we wanna modify it? All right, so that's, that's what I'm trying to, uh, to, to set up here. Oh, there it is, thank goodness. Um, so 
I'm hoping that each person can take, you know, five, 10 minutes, introduce yourself, you know, what's your background? What is, you know, what's the driver for you to be here? Like, why did you put your hand up? There's all kinds of other stuff you could be doing. And what are you really passionate about? Like, what did you sort of join the commission to try and, uh, and try and bring to fruition? Um, the other thing I'd like to understand are, you know, what are your sort of special skills? What are your secret powers that other people should know about so that we can try and make sure that we're, we're making the most of them uh, in the work that we do? Uh, and, and then the, the final part of that is sort of what uh, level of availability do you have um, to, to contribute to the commission? And I, and I appreciate it's going to vary. Uh, at the moment, I can probably do about two hours a week. Uh, now, you don't do it all at once. Sometimes it might be a whole day, uh, et cetera. But um, I think it's important that we, as much as anything, just sort of understand how much time do we have collectively to devote to this? Um, because I think it's important when we have things come to us and they say, oh, would you, want, would you please be involved in this thing? Because we have, we have finite resources. Uh, and so once we have a better sense of that collectively, it's our, you know, it's our, it's our piggy bank of resource that we really have to devote here. Um, hopefully we can, as a group and as a team, uh, use that in the, in, a, in the wisest possible way. Um, so that's, that's the first part of it. And so that would just be to go around everybody. I can't wait to hear these answers. And if people want to suggest other things that you think people should touch on in their, you know, in their introduction, um, please raise them. The, um, the second part, so once we've gotten a little bit better understanding of, of these things, um, I'd like to talk about, you know, what do we think the biggest strategic opportunities are? Now, we have the list from uh, the, the city council about what their priorities are. And I'm not saying that this has to be directly uh, the same thing. Um, you know, you can, you can think outside the box and I've, I've checked the representatives and it's okay as long as it's a really good idea. Um, but to really do it within the framework of what, what's, what are the biggest strategic opportunities around um, uh, increasing our revenues, right? So as a, as a finance and budget, it's usually top line or bottom or cost or, or revenue, right? So what are our biggest opportunities to improve revenues, to cut costs? And that's usually where it ends. I think there's at least two more categories. One is to increase value, um, which is just a mix of, of things to try and get more, more value for the community. And, and, the, and the final one is, is even, are there any opportunities around um, how the commit, how our commission runs. Uh, and if I had somebody who was a great benchmarking expert and, and loved this sort of thing, maybe they could go and examine what the other finance and budget commissions are doing that we could learn, you know, what are they doing? Maybe those are some good ideas that we should be focused on as well. So that's some ideas I had, but I would like to, in a systematic way, try and elicit that from, from everyone. Because I think it's important for me, in my experience, if you get people that want to do things and they know they've got the support of the rest of the people in the group, you can achieve really, really great things. If we're all sort of rolling in different directions or really not on board, we spend a lot of time doing, ma making a lot of uh, light, but not a lot of heat. Uh, so that's what I'm trying to address uh, in the sort of strategic opportunity. Uh, and then there's, I think the tactical or reactive. And I think that's, a, uh, that's often um, can be what, we're, what we get focused on because um, whether it's, a council member or, or the council or another commission comes to us and say, will you please be on the, the whatever committee it is. Um, and, you know, we feel an obligation to, to, we often can feel an obligation to do that. Uh, and that's fine. But I want to, on a sort of holistic, systematic and thoughtful basis to sort of go through these dimensions and to allow that to then drive or uh, help guide me in how I then work with staff uh, to set the agenda for the next 12 months. Okay, so I'd like to take public comment and then hear from my fellow um, commissioners. Okay, so if you'd like to make a public comment, please press star nine on your phone or you can raise your hand through the Zoom link. Let's see here. Mr. Chair, I'm not seeing any public comments. Thank you. All right. I have a if you'd like. Yes, please. Okay. Um, hello again, everyone, all commissioners. Nice to see your lovely faces again. Um, so Gurkhan Sufi, um, biotech entrepreneur, basically background in data science. Um, 
really the skill set kind of transcends from the understanding large complex data sets, whether they're numerical or just uh, like graphical, so on and so forth, uh, image data, and being able to recognize patterns in those. Um, so some programming involved in there to be able to enable that skill set. Um, beyond that, the where where I find more of my talent is um, is in terms of the community, or at least where my ear is in the community is more in the, um, I guess, in the small business uh, collective, um, definitely tech tech focused. Um, so in terms of that area of the economy of Davis, that's where most of my um, acquaintances and friends are. As far as availability, I can, I can also go ahead and see myself putting in two hours a week um, for, for, the, for the commission. Um, yeah, so upwards of 10 hours per month makes a lot of sense. Um, in certain demanding situations, I think that could go up, but yeah, I think 10 is a, is a fair number. Um, in terms of where the revenues, costs, values, and um, operations approach to things, I, I definitely lean more so on the cost cutting side of, uh, of affairs. I think that generally that's where you have most control and it's the easiest to tighten your belt than it is to start to go and look for uh, other avenues of revenues. Um, in terms of the value, I think that some of the other commissions, like they focus on the value of the that is being brought to the community and then we are supposed to kind of like you know, determine is that even fiscally responsible, um, cost cutting. So in terms of that, that is, that's how I see the relationship working. But in terms of cost cutting, I see big opportunities being in capital improvement projects. That's been something that was brought up three, three years ago. Um, and it was, it was more or less kind of just not really, um, it was not thoroughly broken down we've noticed you know cost overruns for budgeted projects you know then they just have more money being put into them um so being able to actually kind of get like some sort of a statistical analysis done from either the engineering department i feel like they should have that type of information um and if they don't who is tracking their budget um yeah that would be kind of kind of fair in terms of the tactical i think that you know that's really circumstantial so we just you know band together for that um yeah, that's generally my my approach to this. And if there were any areas for growth needs, I would say that I think one of the biggest pitfalls that Davis has is it wants to grow or it thinks about growing, but it doesn't have a plan to grow. And so maybe there is some policy decision in there where um, you know we can at least maybe if we don't have a general plan, there's like tranche plans for specific needs. I don't know how the city would handle something like that, but being able to clearly define what the city needs is so it seems like something that can't be done. Well, first of all, thank you for jumping in there. I was um, I was uh, not expecting you to do to do that, but um, uh, let's let's carry that on. Let, let's limit ourselves though to just more about yourself because I think we're gonna we're, we're just not gonna have enough time to go through uh, through everything. So if we can just start this with. Um, what, what uh, the intro to yourself, that would be fantastic. Um, just before I move on, uh, well, actually, let's, let me move on to Commissioner uh, uh, Axt. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Beeman. And uh, I resonate to your idea of bringing some life then to this commission and to adopt a holistic approach uh, for the strategic um, opportunities of this commission. Um, I, I, I joined the commission last year and I immediately I feel like it's a different kind of team because I feel we didn't, because of the pandemic, we didn't have the opportunity to interact personally. And also, um, I don't know the how, how you know, the Brown Act, I don't know how to, you know, manage the uh, interaction among commissioners. And because I was informed that it's not very appropriate to add the other commissioners in your professional network uh, uh, talk about the issues before the meetings. So I uh, just trying to navigate, um, trying to contribute as much as I can. Um, 
And also I understand the staff, they are accountable to their managers and they are not directly accountable to us. And I feel also not willing to um, just uh, send them emails directly, ask for things to be done or things to clarify. So um, anyways, I get help from uh, the previous uh, chair, Donna, and uh, also from uh, Councilman uh, Dan. So uh, um, yeah, I gradually, I'm still learning. I feel like this has a gradually deep uh, learning curve. And, um, so for, for myself, I think that my, um, my special, my specialty is on infrastructure project finance and uh, public finance. I have a master of public administration degree from USC. And I before that, I found my passion in uh, public finance and capital markets. Uh, when I worked for World Bank China mission, I worked on wastewater treatment plants, uh, uh, financial models, and uh, I was uh, intrigued by the financial cash flow models. And also I learned firsthand that uh, sustainable infrastructure investment could bring, uh, improve a quality of life in local communities. So that brings me to the United States to have a master of public administration degree. And after graduation, I followed my passion to consult on transportation projects in Washington DC for six years. And then I um, found my, I started my family in Minnesota. Um, I, I, I had a career break, an extended career break. But uh, after four years, I um, decided to pursue a chartered financial analyst degree just to learn, um, just to follow my passion and also to add some intellectual stimulation to my uh, stay at home mom life. And uh, uh, I found it a really good balance because CFA study, you could do it online and you don't need to be in the classrooms. You could really, um, I could do it when my, my son was dropped off in the childcare. And uh, so it worked out really well. And I completed the, I, um, uh, I, I earned the designation, CFA designation in 2018. And then I started to uh, try to look for a job, a full-time job. Uh, so the return to work pass was not very smooth as I anticipated. It took a long time. And uh, also my family moved from Minnesota to Northern California in 2020 during the pandemic. So uh, you can imagine, you know, it's trying to do a career change. I was a consultant uh, on infra uh, transportation finance. Uh, now I'm looking for a job um, in um, public finance or infrastructure finance investment. I would like to leverage my designation, CFA designation. So, um, so I, I did some work for Global Infrastructure Group in Fitch Readings uh, last year. And it was a return to work program. And it lasted for three years, uh, three months. I learned a lot and uh, on transportation, on energy projects. And uh, um, it, but uh, then this, I completed, after I completed, I completed that return to work program. I, um, now I just landed a new job. I probably will start a new, I start a new job um, in um, early October. So I typically in the past, I usually spent a few hours before the commission meeting to review the documents. And uh, um, other than that, I haven't been doing a lot. And um, so hopefully, um, in the in the future, I will at least uh, allocate um, this amount of time. I would like to keep the consistency and uh, um, maintain my uh, contribution to the commission um, in the future. Great, thank you. Thank you. It's, I had no idea that you had this background and uh, I had to, to learn that and get a wide variety of skills. 
any any other volunteers or I, I'm happy to jump in while you're uh, thinking of your story. These are origin stories. Donna, thank you. So I, I apologize for doing this, but I have to hop off at nine and I'm just, I thought when you were describing your proposal that you were asking us if we were generally thinking that that structure you were describing for doing our strategic planning made sense. I didn't realize we were gonna to try to do all of that or or even do all of our bios tonight. Is So can you just clarify what we're hoping to accomplish tonight? So I was I was a mm, I was originally thinking hoping we could do it, but we spent a bit more time in this other section, um, and so I was thinking we might just go through the structure and framework. Um, but uh, Gurkhan uh, volunteered to to keep going, so uh, we can do this a couple of ways. One is we can get all the way through them, uh, just the the bios, uh, or we can get as far as we can get uh, to nine o'clock, and then uh, come back and finish it off next time. Okay. Um, I, I think it's, it'd be good to have everybody. We don't have Doug, um, Commissioner Busby here. Um, so that's the other thing I have in my mind. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I'm at your pleasure. If you want me to do my bio, I will. I just wanted to make sure we were all kind of on the same page about time and what we were trying to do. If you don't mind, I think it would be, <clears throat> it would be good. It's already got me thinking about, you know, when we come back and talk about the strategic opportunities. So if sure. you don't mind. Sure, I'm happy to do that. So I think most of you, probably know my general bio. I'm a government lawyer um, and I spent the, sort of the first half of my career working for the Legislative Council's Office, which is the agency, staff agency for the legislature. And there I focused largely on environmental law and education law. And I would say I became somewhat more of a specialist in education law, including education finance, which is a world unto itself. Uh, then I spent the second half of my legal career working for the California State Auditor. And I think it was there that I um, developed a lot of the background and experiences that are most relevant to this commission. Uh, a lot of the work the State Auditor does, as you might expect, is financial audit, auditing. We audit all, of, all state agencies. We do the federal compliance audit, which is required of all state agencies to ensure that they use federal funds appropriately. But we also did a really significant amount of performance auditing where we evaluated the performance of various government entities throughout the state at both the state and local level. And one of the programs I was intimately involved in was called the Local Government High Risk Program. Uh, that was a program where the state auditor goes out on a biennial basis and evaluates the fiscal health of all California cities, develops a list of those cities based on their degree of fiscal risk, and then based on that ranking goes out and conducts audits of some of the highest risk cities. I actually wrote the implementing regulations. I was very involved in implementing that program, I was also very involved in many of the audits of local governments. And I guess if I were to describe my skill set, I'd say it's largely rooted in government performance and evaluating the performance of government agencies and also knowing how to make feasible, realistic recommendations that can be implemented. Um, I also have a really strong background, not as an accountant or a finance expert, but as a lawyer, I have a strong background in public finance as well. I've been very involved in the development of a number of budgets, I've drafted um, <laughs> bond acts, I've been just really involved in public finance generally. Um, my involvement on this commission, I'll be honest, I didn't seek this commission out. I sought out a very, very different position in our city related to DJUSD. And uh, Council Member Carson saw me in my unsuccessful bid to fill out an interim position on the school board and suggested that I apply to work on the Finance and Budget Commission, which is how I came to be here. But I'm hopeful that my experiences in government really do lend themselves to work of this on this commission. I am all about being very strategic in the way we do our work, having a plan that's achievable, and then kind of getting the work done. So that's just a short recap. I won't, I could tell, talk lots more, but that's all I'll say for tonight. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, and I've been working with you for almost three years, and I didn't know a lot of the detail. Um, I, yeah, I knew some of it anyways. I really appreciate that. Paul, David, or do you want to, shall I go? David, thank you. Oh, we got both. 
you want to go first there, David? I'd be happy to. So uh, in terms of uh, time availability, I, I do think five to 10 hours a month is about right for me. Um, and for my, my bio, um, I'm a public agency government attorney and law professor. Um, I have a background in environmental and water law. That's my primary practice. Um, that's what I teach, but it goes beyond that. Uh, it, uh, those, the terminology is much broader. So I, I work on public contracting issues, public real estate issues, and public finance issues. Um, I work for the Department of Water Resources, and I help with uh, financial management of that department, uh, budget of several billion, and we operate the largest water utility in the United States. And uh, so I help with bond financing, um, financial management, audits, contracting, all associated with that. Uh, very similar to what you would see with um, uh, Davis uh, Water Utilities and those kinds of rate structures. It's the same model. So I was interested in that. Um, I, I picked uh, this commission or applied for this commission because I had previously served in four other city commissions, and this was one that I hadn't served in, and I thought it would be an opportunity to uh, um, help the community, even if it's just a little bit, and I'm sure that's the motivation of everybody else trying to make uh, a small difference. So that's my background. I can elaborate more, but that's enough. Thank you. Uh, Paul? Yeah, I'll try to be equally brief. Um, I was in college, I was uh, in biology and chemistry. I was a scientist, I went to medical school for two years and decided I didn't want to spend my life being a doctor and somehow managed to become a journalist. And I've covered science, I've covered medicine. Um, the, I've, uh, but as it evolved, even in covering those things, I became an investigative reporter. Uh, that seemed to be my, my skill set uh, to look into things in some depth and find things that were wrong and it might be fixable. And uh, I would like to think I could bring that to the commission. I think my biggest, one, of the, one reason I, chose the Finance and Budget Commission to apply to and was happy to be chosen was the, I felt that this, someone was running for office. It was, I might as well tell you, it was Matt Williams. And he kept talking about this huge buildup of incomplete infrastructure. And in a sense that we were trading off uh, in order to make, manage budgets, we weren't doing enough to keep the streets and the city running the way it should. And he came up with some numbers and I thought they were absolutely astronomical. I didn't believe them, I talked to him. He made some pretty convincing arguments. And I know that you know, his is a worst case scenario, but I became interested in the issue and that's why I'm on this commission. I have, I've taken a, a class or two in statistics. I've uh, uh, I took a, a class at the, or two at the uh, while on a sabbatical as a journalist at the uh, at, at Stanford from the business school. I don't claim to be an expert on on any of that. I think the biggest issue facing this city is communicating to the public why it is we can't do everything, why the city can't do everything. We can't fix. We can't get the roads to hundred percent. Nobody does actually. We can't get the bicycle paths perfect. We can't, uh, uh, if you have a problem at City Hall, it may take you a while to get it resolved. Those are all budget issues. And I think uh, to the extent I'd like to contribute to A, the understanding of why that's, why that's a problem and B, I'd like to communicate why, uh, uh, maybe find some ways to do something about it. End of, end of statement. I'm also a Great. writer. I, I, even though I'm retired and probably could spend eight to 10 hours a month uh, on the commission, uh, I, I still spend a lot of time writing. And uh, uh, I've 
published three novels for young adults, and I've got uh, an untold number of pages that probably will never be published, but I would like to see published, but, uh, a fiction, by the way. Anyway, that's, uh, that's my resume. Thank you. I knew about 20% of that. Um, appreciate it. So I will do a quick uh, bio for myself, which I promised to do at the front, but I had great, great uh, volunteering there. So um, I guess my story is I, I grew up on, uh, on, a, on a farm on Road 95. So I've been in the area. I was in the area for a long time growing up. I got as far away from the farm as I could. Uh, Australia um, doesn't get any further than that, really. Uh, and was brought back by my, my family uh, just to be closer to, uh, to my folks. Um, my training is in economics uh, and finance. I got a degree in philosophy because I had nothing better to do. Um, but what I think drives me uh, is really um, a desire to, to, to try and make things better, uh, whether that's technically and optimizing things analyzing things, um, uh, making things more efficient. Um, I got a, I, I um, started out as life as a consultant and that's where I currently am. We got a, a small business in Davis and we do specialize in, in energy, uh, but almost all the work we do is, is analysis, uh, analysis of, of costs and benefits, stuff like that. So that's sort of the part of what I could bring uh, to this commission. I also worked for the utility in, in Sydney, Australia for five years. So I felt I had uh, something to bring around asset management, infrastructure management, uh, delivery. Um, so those, I guess, are some of the skill sets. Also, because I've got a, a team and they you know, hire lots and lots of UCD grads, uh, there are times when we have a spare capacity. And so I try and look for pro bono sort of things to do. And so we have done things in the past, like bringing together metrics for the city. Uh, and so I'll continue to look for opportunities there. Um, I think the two, two things that get me a little bit fired up. Uh, one is um, intergenerational equity. I do worry about taking on a lot of debt um, uh, for our children um, and just how we manage that, whether it's it's like money or it's climate debt, uh, these sort of things. And I think we, play an we can help and play an important role in, in, in trying to keep the balance right there. Uh, and the other is just around economic literacy. E economics, I did, um, I found, I started off with life as a mathematician, but found the dismal science much more to my liking. Um, and I think there's a, a, in the same way, it's important we communicate why the city can't do everything all at once. I think it's also important that we're able to communicate clearly um, economic, just the application of economics to the decisions that we need to make. And I feel miserably all the time, but I'm going to keep trying. Um, so that's me. Uh, I'm not, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so look, thank you for um for, for being game uh, here, I you know I wish we were sort of in the in the chambers together. I understand that that's something that's going to be uh, possible uh, moving forward. I have raised it with our our, our liaisons uh, on council, and I also raised it with staff. So hopefully, and I don't know Kelly, if you want to make us say anything about does it look good for next month or. If I had to bet, I would say no. We wouldn't be going back in person next month. This is it's the council's decision, and so far, the um, the only group that they've authorized to go back in person is the council. Okay. So. All right. Um, I'll keep you posted. Okay. Uh, well, and I don't know how everybody else feels, so I'm only speaking for myself. Um, but in in work, when I'm now in meetings with other people in the same room. I, I feel uh, I feel much better, so I'm I am I am keen that we we have that opportunity. But uh, anyway, um, so look, I want to park it here. Um, other than uh, procedurally, is there anything that anybody wants to say about the proposal for next time? To then we're, we're, to collectively go through what are the strategic opportunities, um, who wants to do what, how are we going to agree to support one another? Because I I feel with some experience, you know, if you do a lot of work. And then people say, oh, it's not, and I've had support, don't get me wrong, but I want people to feel like if they do, if they work on something and people say they're generally supportive if, you know, under these conditions that we, we, we're supportive going forward. So I want to sort of talk about how, how we, um, how we can, how, how, if we can be more supportive, what that looks like, uh, and then maybe use that to then line up um, people on uh, the, both the, the reactive stuff, but also strategic stuff. Oh, Donna. So I 
really like where you're going. And I, I know that doing this kind of work is um, challenging and it's especially challenging right now because we're on Zoom, but I'll throw this idea out there. It seems like you have a sort of general framework in mind, but I wonder if you want to form a very short ad hoc subcommittee that would work with you to develop a, kind of a, a document that will structure our discussion for that next meeting. And it seems like you have parts to what you want to do. You know, we've kind of gone through this part where we talked about our backgrounds, but then you want to have kind of a general discussion about um, sort of strategic. What, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, uh, so kind of, you, we've gone through our bios and our backgrounds, but then I think you want to sort of have a list of what are the things we want to work on? What are our priorities? What are they? And if there's some way that you want to structure that conversation, I'm not sure. But then you want us to kind of hone in then on once we've decided what our priorities are, how we would accomplish those in, in the form of yeah. subcommittees. And so it's just, throw, I'm throwing this out there because I know it's a lot of work. I know in the past when we've gone through this process, it helped to have a, a, a document that kind of structured our thinking as we went through it at the meeting. So I'm just throwing that out there and offering the possibility that you might want to cobble together a three-person subcommittee to kind of tackle that document with you. I think that's a great idea if I can get two other people to, to join me because uh, you know we can only talk uh, you know in a group of three but it, it you know I have it, I have felt that having that subcommittee committee makes it much more likely that you're going to be um, uh, rough out the, uh, the, the iron out the rough edges before you bring it to the rest of the group which I have not you know clearly done uh, for this particular exercise so I'd like to take you up on that yeah, and I'm really, uh, literally, I'm just talking about like putting together what would be an agenda document that would structure the strategic planning discussion. That's really all I'm talking about. So I'm, I'm happy to work with you on it. Um, and I think we need three people. I think three is a good number. Great. Do we have anybody else who has an, in, has an interest? And I, I see it could even just be, you know, what are we going to put on the slides that walk us through the bullet points? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and maybe just the two of us do it. But if there's a third person, that's great. If three is a crowd. <laughs> Not with you, Gagur. <laughs> All right. Well then, I'm um, I'm game. Yeah. We're getting the band back together. All right. Uh, so what do we do? We just note in the minutes that we do. We have to vote. Do it. Sorry. Do we have to? Should we put this to a vote that this is a good idea? Probably. And we're going to have a public comment before we do so. Let's let's do that, okay? And then we get everybody on on the same page. I hopefully this is not controversial. Um, uh, so let's do. Let's open up for public comment. Anybody come? I want to publicly comment on uh, forming a sub a quick subcommittee so that we are prepared uh, for the next meeting and have uh, more of a uh, an agreed framework for everybody to work to. I'll second that. There there are no public comments. Thank you. Then we can second that. So let's put it to a vote. Um, I've got every. Uh, all right. Let's let's go. Uh, Commissioner Neville. Aye. Commissioner Sufi. Aye. Commissioner Sandino. Aye. Commissioner Jacobs. Aye. Commissioner Axt. Aye. Great. Uh, Commissioner Beeman, aye. So it passes unanimously. I'll uh, reach out, um, Donna and Gurkern, and we'll just find a time that, that works for us. It should, should, um, should be soon, qu relatively quick and, and easy. Thank you. All right. Um, I think the next thing that we have, and just mindful, we've got Donna here for another 11 minutes, um, which I think is perfectly good. Um, we have the long, sorry, what am I, seven? Subcommittee reports. Subcommittee reports, thank you. And I just, um, I just want to interject that you need to make sure, given that it's after 8.30, that you've got support of the commission to oh, continue a new item. That was nice. No, that, thank you. That pesky little rule. Yeah, no, I like that. Um, so let's, let's, do we have to put a motion or do we just, can we do a, 
this point. I, you don't. What's that? Well, technically a motion, but honestly, if you just if nobody's complaining about it, then you can continue. Oh, as somebody who has complained in the past, I want to do this by the book. Then uh, by the book, then you need a motion. I, I I move that we extend this till nine o'clock to go quickly through any of the updates. I think the long range calendar uh, we can wait till next time to be honest because. Um, well, let, we'll ask if there's any questions. I don't think it would take a long time. So I move that we extend it the, the period to uh, 9 p.m. Seconded. Uh, I'll take it to the vote. Um, do I have to do public comment? I do. You, you don't have to do it. I don't. Great. Well, and there's no public, so. There is no, yeah. Okay. All right. So we'll go for a vote. Uh, oh, sorry. Com Commissioner Axe. Uh, no. I. I and I, I kind of want to have a look at my son because my husband is out of town. He usually goes to bed at 8.30. I'm, I, I need to just check yeah, to him. I, I, will we lose quorum? Do we, do, we, do we have enough vote? Yes. Fine. I think regardless, you should go and, and do that. And we'll be good. We'll be fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. I, I, I will see if I can come back and uh, I will just uh, need to take a break right now. Thank you. I appreciate okay. your participation. All right. Okay. Okay. So uh, with the remaining members, um, Commissioner Sufi? Aye. Commissioner Sandino? Aye. Commissioner Jacobs? Aye. Aye. Commissioner Neville? Aye. Commissioner Beeman, aye. Okay, so let's, um, uh, subcommittee updates that weren't already updated uh, previously. Police department and safety contracts. Yes, uh, let, me, let, me, let me take a shot at that. So uh, if, you, if you recall from last time we met a couple months ago, uh, I was hopeful that we would have a report to share with you for the uh, entire subcommittee a draft report to look at and also we were going to have staff vet it um, both paul and i have continued to work on it but we, we don't have obviously a written document to share for this meeting uh, but we're, we're remaining hopeful for the next meeting and uh, i'll circle back with you ezra to give you an update as we get closer yes thank you if we need to add that to agenda just need a little bit of uh, advance warning yes great all right um Subcommittee related, oh wait, that's done. Uh, subcommittee related to economic impact and major development. So I haven't made any progress on the local purchasing preferences. Um, still intend to, I think my next my next thing is I gotta meet with staff and just talk about why we don't have it or what the pro, what the challenges are of, of implementing it. That was the direction I got. Um, with respect to development impact fees, I did have a chat to, to Commissioner Busby and I do think uh, it'll be something we'll we'll speak to uh, in the next session, and also just around strategic priorities. I don't think there's any. I don't. I don't believe there's any update there, unless I'm correct. Me if I'm wrong, um, Commissioner Sufi. Nope, you're good. Okay, and then I think we got the update from the downtown plan at this stage, Commissioner Neville. Yeah, that's correct. Great, and, and then Commissioner uh, Commissioner Gus is not here. And there's nobody else that can speak for that committee, I don't believe. So then we get to the, the, the cap, uh, and I believe we had an update already on that. So I think that covers off the- um, yeah. One point is I think that it's going to basically go, it's gonna be concluded in like what, October 12th, second, October 12th, second, one of the two, um, or October 10th. So the first week of October is where I'm fairly certain of. Um, and so we probably will not have an opportunity to discuss again or discuss this before that passes. Um, so yeah, that passes the review period that council has set forth. I think technically I'm, I need to recuse myself and not make a comment. So it's just a bit awkward. Um, gotcha. Well, that is, that's just the update, so yeah. Well, you're occurring, since you're the uh, deputy here, we, we should probably figure out how we do it. Because it's going to keep coming up, uh, just a way for us to do that seamlessly. Um, 
whenever this comes up, yeah, I can go over, go ahead and take over conversation. I don't know if you go into panelists or not panelists, but audience or what the process for that is, but. Um, well, that one's really quick and you can say, oh, I'm talking about this, I'll take on the chair and then he can zoom me out and then you can deal with your business and then, um, and then hand it back to me when you're ready. Got it. And it's October 10th. So yeah, we will not be able to have our conversation. It will be the night of our next meeting. Great. Okay. Long range calendar. I think you have to call for a public comment, but um, I'm going to note again that at this point, there is no members of the public. <laughs> Great. Uh, and really, I just want to ask, is there anything that we've missed here? It's going to move around, I think, after we do our strategic planning. <clears throat> but I'll open this up for anybody. Oh, Donna. Donna, please. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Things may take a different shape after we do the long-range strategic plan. But I just want to throw out here a couple of things that I think are really, really important that I want to keep on our radar. Um, the first is an issue that we've talked about a number of times. I know Commissioner Jacobs has mentioned, and that is for us as a commission to get a presentation from the city's human resources manager so that we could get a really good handle on um, where the staffing, I'll call them shortages maybe, or maybe that's not the right word, but there's there are clearly some staffing shortages in certain departments that are really having an impact on the public. And it'd be really important for us to know what those are to know what the city's plans are for addressing that. So that would be a really valuable presentation for us to receive, I believe. So I wanna throw that one out there. Okay. The other one that I just wanna throw out is one I know is of interest to the city council. And that is for us to, as a commission, to potentially assist in identifying revenue sources that would feed the housing trust fund. I know this is a real priority of councils and in the past we've talked a bit about this, but we haven't really put it on our agenda or do, done much to take it up. And um, the third is a little bit related to that in some ways. And that is a concern that I have is the fiscal sustainability of the new reform department of housing and social services. Right now it's just funded primarily through some grant funds it doesn't really have a long-term fiscal plan for sustainability. I think it would be helpful for this commission to potentially assist in that. I, I want that department to be very successful. I, I know the city does as well. So those are just three items, and there might be things that will take up a lot in more detail when we do our strategic plan, but I wanted to throw them out here. Great, thank you. <clears throat> I've got a panelist with, uh, no, that was Donna. Any, anyone else? I feel like these are things that we need to discuss. I mean, during the session uh, next time as well. All right. Um, hearing none. Um, so I, I think we're at the end of the agenda. I um, give myself a C minus for a number of reasons, but uh, being uh, 30 minutes after the, uh, the witching hour is primarily the primary one. So I will, I will strive to do better. Thank you all for your indulging me and um, I will uh, look forward to doing better next time. Thank you all. I think we need a motion to adjourn. Yes, we do. I motion to adjourn. I second that motion. Any discussion? Hearing none. Commissioner Sufi? Aye. Commissioner Sandino? Aye. Commissioner Jacobs? Aye. Commissioner Neville. Aye. Commissioner Beeman. So moved. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night. Good night.